The speaker today's lecture is Professor Bern Stempels, and he is a professor of mathematics, statistics, and the computer science at the University of California, Berkeley. And he received his PhD in 1987 from the University of Washington and the Technical University of Darmstadt. After two postdoc years, he taught at Cornell University and before joining US UC Berkeley in 1995. And he has a long list of honors to name few. He received the Sloan Fellowship and the National Young Investigator Fellowship and the David Lucille Packard Fellowship and the Humboldt Research Prize. He was a vice president of American West Medical Society and was elected as a fellow there. <coughs> And uh, Professor Bernd Stumpel has uh, made a uh, contribution to various areas of mathematics, including algebraic geometry, commutative algebra, dif uh, discrete, math uh, discrete geometry, tropical geometry, algebraic statistics, and the computational biology. Professor Bernd Stumpel will be appointed as a distinguished pro visiting professor by KAIST, and uh, we are grateful to to Professor Stompel for accepting this, this position and uh, visiting us for two weeks despite his busy schedule. Next year, he will be with us at least three months during the summer to give a course in one of his uh, exciting research area and uh, organize the uh, international conferences at KAIST. Today, he will deliver first of uh, three independent lectures. The title of the lecture is The Central Curve in Linear Programming. Uh, before Professor Stumpel starts, so let me just make a quick announcement. And uh, Professor Stumpel like to discuss mathematics with the young people. So <laughs> at six this, this evening, we're gonna have a dinner uh, at <laughs> at uh, uh, Wang Bisong Chinese restaurant <laughs> with him. And uh, so graduate students and uh, post actors are invited. And the uh, faculty members will have a dinner uh, on Monday at the second lecture. Okay, so please raise a hand if you want to join us this evening. So graduate students and the and the postdoctor only. <laughs> so I have to make a reservation. Graduate students or postdoctor? What? You are just a Seven. Eight. About eight. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. So, ten. Ten person, reasonable ten series. Okay. Okay. So, let's welcome Professor Wang Liang. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the uh, nice introduction and the opportunities. Let me get the screen up here. <clears throat> Okay, so yeah, I'd like to tell you about the uh, central curve in linear programming. Everything I say is joint work with Jesus de Loera and Cynthia Vincent, and one of the goals this afternoon is to explain the picture. So I'd like to explain this colorful picture, and uh, as Professor Ko said, I'd like to uh, discuss with young people. So uh, what that means, I encourage you to ask me questions during the lecture, and as I always tell my calculus students, if you don't have questions for me, I will have questions for you. <laughs> so you better ask me questions. So a quick review of, of linear programming. So linear programming is a fundamental uh, applied problem in, in, linear, in, uh, in optimization, and there's two formulations. There's the primal and the dual formulation, and I copied this on the blackboard here. So suppose we're given a fixed matrix A of rank D with n columns and uh, C is a, 
a vector, column vector of length n, and b is in the image of a, then in the primal problem we want to solve the linear system of equations ax equal b over the non-negative real vectors x, and want to do this optimally, we want to maximize a linear function. So maximize C transpose subject to AX equal B, X non-negative. Now whenever in optimization you have a good problem, um, there's a corresponding dual problem, and uh, from your undergraduate optimization class, which here at KAIST is taught in the ISY, uh, in the OR department, uh, you know that the dual is to minimize B transpose Y subject to A transpose Y greater or equal C and uh, we're going to put a slack vector S in there so to have the equational description. So those are the primal and the dual linear program. Now to solve a linear program there are basically two approaches. So traditionally since the 1950s there's something called the simplex algorithm so the simplex algorithm works by going, so this feasible set is a, a polytope, a polyhedron. So maybe uh, think about this three-dimensional cube, that's the feasible set, and we want to find the best vertex. Okay? So in the simplex algorithm we start at a vertex and we travel along the edges, we go from edge to edge until we reach the optimal vertex of our feasible set. That's called the simplex algorithm. But then about 20, 25 years ago, a new paradigm got introduced, so-called interior point methods. And interior point methods travel through the interior of the feasible polytope. And today I'm going to talk about interior point methods. Okay? So to set this up, we're going to change the cost function. We're going to replace the linear objective function by something called the logarithmic barrier function, which is we're adding on a term, lambda times the sum of the logarithms of the coordinates, where lambda is a, a positive real constant. Now, this is well defined because xi is positive, right? So the logarithm of a positive number is well defined. This function is concave and so therefore uh, there will be unique maximum and we're going to call this new problem the barrier problem. So we take the primal problem, we change it to the barrier problem, maximize this function again over the same feasible region, AX equal B, X non-negative. And I'm going to write X star of lambda for the unique solution. It's concave, so it has unique maximal solution. Okay? Now the picture that you have in mind when looking at this is something like this. So the feasible region is a, a polytope, maybe this hexagon, and uh, so that's P, the feasible region. The logarithmic barrier function F lambda is defined on the relative interior. It's concave, but it drops off to minus infinity on the boundary. Okay, so we have a concave function, it goes off to minus infinity on the boundary, but in the middle it attains unique maximum and in blue I draw the curve that's traced out by these maxima. So for every choice of lambda there will be unique optimal point x star of lambda and the primal central path is simply this path as lambda runs over all positive real numbers. Now if lambda is very very large then we're close to the red point but if lambda is very, very small, then we travel towards the optimal vertex. So the green vertex is where we want to go. That's the goal of linear programming. Okay? Now at the other end of the spectrum, so if lambda is infinity, we have the so-called analytic center of this polytope. Every polytope has an analytic center. That's the unique point where f sub infinity gets maximized. But f infinity really is the sum of the logarithms of the coordinates. So the red point is the unique point where the product of the coordinates is maximal. Okay? So in the interior we have all positive points and this is called the analytic center. So we're traveling um, from the analytic center by our interior point method to the optimal solution which is the green vertex. Now this traveling is done, I'll talk about this a little later, by a numerical 
path continuation method, just when you study and you know undergraded numerical analysis, when you solve a uh, vector field in ODE, you take tiny steps and correct, and so it's basically uh, that kind of approach. That's the central path. Now, one more slide on, on linear programming basics. So all of this on the first three slides is standard undergraded textbook optimization material. So there's a relation between the primal and the dual solutions. Then we can put the constraints together. We can look at both equations, ax equal b, x transpose y minus s equal c. So we have the primal equation, we have the dual equation, we have uh, x non-negative on the primal side, s non-negative on the dual side. But we have this so-called complementary slackness that says xi times si is zero. So this says they can't be both positive. So if xi is positive, then si must be zero and vice versa. So uh, solving this system is equivalent to linear programming. So let's summarize this in a theorem. In fact, it behaves gracefully with respect to the perturbation. So for every positive lambda, we can look at these equations. Ax equal b, and the, the dual equation, and xi si equals lambda. Then there is a unique real solution um, to these equations where both the x and the s coordinates are strictly positive, and the corresponding x coordinates solve the original barrier problem. And everything behaves well as lambda goes down to zero, then uh, this point for lambda equals zero is the unique solution of the slackness problem and the corresponding x naught is the primal optimum and the corresponding y naught is the dual optimum. Okay? So that's the end of my introduction to linear programming. So are there any questions about this? So this is the kind of stuff that you will learn in the first undergraded class on optimization. Any questions? And remember, <laughs> if you don't have questions for me, I'll have questions for you. The other thing that's important to note, I never ask questions to people in the first row. <laughs> so there's a, prob so there's a l large chance that somebody in the last row will be asked a question. Everything clear? There's no stupid question, like for example, what is a logarithm? <laughs> or what is a pentagon? Now, and what is a hexagon? Now would be the time to ask. How did you follow the path? Okay, how do I follow the path? So, the path is given in some implicit form. And so maybe I know, this is a numerical method, maybe I have some point on the path. And I have some information about the gradient vector. So then I take a, a certain step along the gradient vector. And then up here, I have to correct. I go back down. So it's always, I take a step, I go back down. And this is basically a step on the gradient direction. That's a Newton iteration. So you know, again, from your undergraded numeric analysis class, that Newton iteration has quadratic convergence if you're close by. So Newton method is very, very good keeps you back on track if you didn't go too fast. Now, since you asked, now imagine the path was like this. If it's very, very curvy, then I have to take a very small step size, right? So here I can have a large step size. But if it's very curvy, I can only take small steps. Right? So I have to be very, very careful. So that's going to be important today. The larger, the more curvy the path, the longer the running time, because I have to take many, many, many steps. Okay, that answer your question. Okay, so what is this talk about? So here's two contributions that we're making in our paper. The first one concerns a question that was asked by Bayer and Lagarias in 1989. So in the 80s, there was a lot of excitement in this field. Uh, early in the 80s there was Kachian who gave the first polynomial time algorithm using uh, interior point methods for linear programming. 
That wasn't very practical, but then Karmakar came along in the uh, around 85 and described basically this method that was both polynomial time and, and more practical. And then uh, many people worked on this. In particular, there was a sequence of three papers by Bayer and Lagarias called the Nonlinear Geometry of Linear Programming, where they studied the geometry of this path. And in particular, they argued that this central path is actually an algebraic curve. Now, that means this curve there is, is characterized locally by the vanishing of polynomial equations. Now, that's not obvious from the definition, right? From the definition, we're optimizing a function that has logarithms in it, and it's a priori not obvious, but you can check, you know, that the derivative of the logarithm being 1 over x, that this is actually an algebraic curve. But they suggested to describe the prime ideal of this curve, that is to say, to characterize all polynomial functions that vanish on this curve. And today we're going to see the solution to this problem. So we're going to describe uh, the ideal, the prime ideal of this curve. It's an irreducible curve. So if you're not an algebraist, right, so prime ideal is like prime time or prime rib, it's a very good ideal. <laughs> now, this is the picture that an algebraist would draw. So this picture represents the so-called Zariski closure of the picture on the left. So what we do is our feasible region, our hexagon, really comes from some hyperplane arrangements. So we draw all the facet describing lines or hyperplanes, but that cuts out more polyhedra, bounded polyhedra and unbounded regions. And the central curve extends to all of these regions, right? So what we have here in blue, the Zariski closure, is the set of all zeros of that polynomial. So I write down all the zeros that vanish on the little curve on the left, and then I go to the right and I ask Mathematica, if I'm old, or Sage, if I'm young, to plot all the zeros of the blue polynomials, and then I get the stuff on the right. Okay. And now, of course, it seems like every region has a red analytic center and every region has some green optimal points. So we're going to explore this. So as we go along, we're going to explore this geometry and we're going to find this prime ideal. The second contribution concerns the global curvature of the central path and hence of the central curve. So by the central curve, I will mean the algebraic curve uh, that's the full curve and the central path is just a little thing. And this is of big interest because you want to, if I can bound the curvature, the global curvature, then this gives me an upper bound on the number of steps in my numerical method, right? So if I can say the curve is not too curvy, then I can take large steps and then the running time will be lower. In particular, in 2005, Didier and co-authors uh, studied the global curvature and they gave a bound of what's called the corresponding Gauss curve and our second contribution is to offer a refined bound for this for this Gauss curve degree and we'll see what we'll get. So I said already curvature is important for numerical and period point methods. Maybe the combinatorialists among you know that uh, recently the famous Hirsch conjecture was disproved which uh, tells us about the edge length of a path on, uh, on the, in the simplex method. And uh, a couple of recently, Desar offered a continuous Hirsch conjecture, which contains is a sort of a bound, a linear bound, basically, for the global curvature. And our bound makes a very, very small contribution. We're not claiming, you know, to solve the continuous Hirsch conjecture. We make a very small contribution to this discussion. So those are the two contributions. Okay, let's enjoy the pictures. Let's think a little bit about classical algebraic geometry. So here is a, a polygon that's a seven gone, an arrangement of seven lines in the plane, and uh, my linear program is go east. Okay, so my objective function points to the right and is called go east. Now you can see uh, in blue we have the, the, the central curve, 
So this is an algebraic curve of degree 6. I claim the blue curve is an algebraic curve of degree 6. Well, it's at least 6, right, because this red line meets the curve in 6 points. And so imagine, you know, what's linear programming? Well, I travel along this curve maybe until I get to the optimal point, but I move, you know, this red line sweeps um, vertically from the left to the right. And this is an algebraic curve degree 6. In classical algebraic geometry, this is called the polar curve of this arrangement. Right? So if you have a plane curve of some degree, say 7, and you have a distinguished point in the plane, maybe called east, then the polar of that sextic curve with the point called east is an algebraic curve degree 6, and it's this curve. Okay. You said now, the polar of the seven lines. The, the seven lines is a reducible curve of degree seven. So the union of the seven lines is a reducible curve of degree seven in the plane. That curve of degree seven in the plane has a polar curve with respect to a given center. The name of that center is east. And that's an, re that's an irreducible curve of degree six, namely this blue curve. Now is this clear? Everybody in the last row, what, what's the point east, right? So I have an objective function. That means I sweep to the right, right? Now the set of all lines that are vertical, what does it mean to be a parallel family of lines? It means it's a bunch of lines that go through a common point at infinity, right? So on the line of infinity, there's a distinguished point called east, and the set of all lines to that point east is the set of level lines here of this linear program. Let's redraw this picture by taking a projective transformation that takes our objective function, our point go east, and moves it into the finite part of the projective plane. And here's the same picture. So at the upper right, I have the previous picture. On the left side, I have exactly the same picture, but now the distinguished go east point has been moved to this point here in the finite part of the plane. And, uh, well, the family of vertical lines, the level lines of my linear program, this is now a, uh, a family of, of all the lines, you know, that pass through this distinguished point, right? So, the set of lines that are go vertical is the set of all points, you know, all lines that pass through this point. And you can see, this is the same curve, right? It's exactly the same curve. And you can see now in this new visualization that this sextic curve is three nested ovals. And the, the central oval is a, a so-called spectrahedron. It's a convex region in the plane. Okay, so, so this curve over there of degree 6 in the real projective plane has three connected components that are nested. Okay, so is picture clear? The gentleman all the way in the back with the white jacket, is the picture clear? Okay, any questions? You can ask your neighbor. Okay. So this is just a little warm-up, just a picture of the situation for a linear program with seven lines in the plane. Let's get started. So the first goal is to understand the prime ideal, the set of all polynomials that vanish on the central curve. And to set this up, uh, I need to do a little bit of algebra. I need to inflict a little bit of algebra on you. So first of all, I have to define the field over which I'm going to work. So the philosophy here today is A is a fixed matrix, but the right-hand side, B and C, they are general. Okay? So A is some very, very special fixed matrix, maybe coming from some network problem or some traveling salesman <laughs> problem, some very special matrix that's fixed, but the right-hand side and the cost function varies. So I'm going to form the field K, which is the extension of Q, by whatever the entries of A are. So if A has only rational entries, then QA is the field of rational numbers. If there's a square root of 2 somewhere in this matrix, then this is going to be some number field. Okay? But B and C, the entries of the 
column vector B and the row vector C are transcendentals. I'm going to assume that the entries of B and C are sort of unknowns and so K is the rational function field in the B's and C's over the number field generated by the entries of A. Okay? That's the field I'm going to work over. Let's look at the linear subspace spanned by the rows of A and the cost vector C. Right? So A is my matrix, C is a cost vector, so here I have my matrix, I have a cost vector, and together, you know, they span a linear subspace of K to the, of K to the N, and by the hypothesis, this linear subspace has dimension D plus 1. Now here's what we're going to do to this linear subspace. We're going to take the reciprocal of this linear subspace. So LAC is this linear subspace, and the coordinate-wise reciprocal I denote by LAC inverse, well, it's just the inverse, coordinate-wise inverse of my linear subspace. So I'm going to take any vector in this linear subspace, this should be a K, I'm sorry. This, I take any vector in this linear subspace whose coordinates are non-zero, and I just take the reciprocal, coordinate-wise. 1 over u1, da 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 and then I close it up. Right? So this reciprocal of, you can do this to lin any linear subspace. Any linear subspace in a vector space with a distinguished basis has a reciprocal, and I'm going to call this reciprocal the central sheet. Yes, sir? How do we consider C as a member of Yeah, I'm sorry, this is a K. That's K. Yeah, that's a typo. Thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, what about this? Well, so for a geometer, like a uh, gentleman in the back, for, the, for a geometer, this is the image of this linear space under the classical Cremona transformation. Uh, the commoner torics of this uh, kind of situation has been studied quite a bit by Jun He and his collaborators. They've really used this construction to, to get wonderful results in, in matroid theory. So this is emerging as an interesting object and we're going to use it here. I'm going to call this the central sheet and that's a non-linear variety of dimension d plus 1. So the cartoon is, I start with a blue linear space and then I get the central sheet which is a non-linear rational variety of the same dimension. Okay, now let's take the central sheet and intersect it with the affine space AX equal B. So I just look at this linear system of equations on the central sheet. So this one has dimension D plus 1. This one has co-dimension D. So I'm intersecting some non-linear thing of dimension D plus 1 with a linear thing of dimension D. I expect the intersection to be a curve. And in fact it is a curve and it's exactly our curve. So the Lemma says the primal central curve equals this intersection. Okay? Now the theorem says that this holds not just set theoretically, but it also holds ideal theoretically. So the prime ideal that we're interested in of polynomials that vanish on the central curve is the obvious linear equations, the d-coordinates of the column vector ax minus b, plus whatever the prime ideal of the central sheet happens to be. Now, from that we know that this d plus one dimensional central sheet and the curve have the same degree, and that degree is a, a matroid invariant, an, an invariant of matroids called the Merbius number. Okay? It's a certain matroid. So this is nice, right? So now we've reduced the problem to describing the ideal J of the central sheet, but that was solved by others, so Proudfoot and Spire already gave this ideal, described this ideal in 2006. Not only did they give generators for this ideal, not only did they give a Gropner basis for this ideal, they gave a universal Gropner basis of the ideal. So if you have an ideal, prime ideal, the best thing you could have is a universal Gropner basis. It's a, a Gropner basis simultaneously for every term order, and then putting the pieces together, this answers the bayer lagarius question. Let me give you a little bit of details on these equations, just to get a sense. So how do you get these equations? Well, 
We want to get equations um, that hold on the reciprocal of a linear space. Well, we should start with the equations that hold on the linear space. Right? So if you have a linear subspace, well, you are interested in vectors that are perpendicular. But to get the good equations here, you should take vectors that are non-zero with minimal support with respect to inclusion. So those are called co-circuits. So a co-circuit of a linear space is a non-zero vector of minimal support. Okay, so take such a co-circuit, V1 up to Vn, well it gives a linear equation, right? So sum Vi Xi on the linear space. But we want an equation on the reciprocal. So, you know, so this is the equation on the reciprocal. Now we have to clear denominators and this is the clear denominator version. So up there, these co-circuit polynomials is by taking equations that hold on your linear space of minimal with respect to support, inclusion, and then reciprocalizing this equation. Uh, the Möbius number refers to the geometric lattice and uh, a good way to think about this here, it counts the bounded regions inside the restricted hyperplane arrangement that we get by restricting to the level hyperplane. Right? So we have our plane AX equal B but we have uh, C transpose X equals a fixed number and that gives us the degree of the central curve. So we saw that in the diagram so this Möbius number that we were interested in is the number of bounded regions inside this red space. So, so these, you know, hyperplanes here, they define an arrangement inside the red hyperplane and the number of bounded regions, six in this example, is the degree of this curve. That's always true. And um, now, if the matrix A were generic, if the entries of A were random, then we can always determine this number, it's n minus 1 choose d, but in practice A, as I said, will be some sparse matrix, maybe coming from some operations research application, and then there'll be a special matroid invariant that makes this number much smaller. Now the paper by Broutford and Speyer that I mentioned not only gives this universal Grobner basis but of course once you have the universal Grobner basis you can read off a lot of information such as the Hilbert series, uh, the resolution, syzygies are known and uh, in particular the degree and the genus. I'm going to refer later to the genus of this curve. Okay, so this is the answer to the bayer uh, to the bayer Lagarius question. Any comments, questions, more typos? Okay. Then let's come to the second topic, which is the global curvature of this object. So this follows the approach of Didier and others. So let's first of all recall the definition of curvature. So suppose um, I have a, a curve in real M space. Suppose I have a smooth algebraic curve in real M space. So by definition, the total curvature is the arc length of the image of this curve under the Gauss map. So what's the Gauss map? It's a smooth curve. So at every point, I have a, a tangent direction. So as I travel along the curve, right, I have a, a tab tangent direction. So this unit tangent vector I can plot as a point on the sphere. Right? So if this is a curve in 3 space, I can draw a two-dimensional sphere over there. As I travel along, this traces out a curve on the sphere. Right? Clear? Okay, that's called the Gauss curve. So this, is a, if I, this curve is in real M space. Uh, the Gauss map so takes a point to this tangent direction in M minus 1 space. And by definition, the total curvature is the arc length of the Gauss curve. Now if this has no curvature, if this is a straight line, right, then I'm constant. Then nothing happens in the Gauss curve. So the arc length is zero, very small to zero. Okay? So that's the definition 
of total curvature. Now this quantity, uh, the total curvature is bounded above by pi, pi is 3.14 and so on, times the degree of the corresponding projective curve. So what we want to do here in this analysis is make the problem easier by passing to you know, complex projective geometry. Now the sphere on which the Gauss curve uh, lives double covers the projective plane so I can draw the corresponding projective plane and then as a curve in projective m minus 1 space the this is an algebraic curve and it has a degree so in in symbols so here we have the uh, total curvature is the arc length of the Gauss curve is bounded above by pi times the degree of the projective curve so in projective geometry another way to uh, to say this you know so I look at all the tangent lines and that sweeps out a curve in the plane at infinity. I can identify my PM minus 1 by the plane at infinity. So in particular by this construction if I start with a space curve I get a unique curve in the projective plane. That would be the case where M is 3. So here's the theorem. So the degree of the projective Gauss curve, this quantity, satisfied a certain bound again in terms of matroid invariance. So the degree of the Gauss curve, well it's always bounded above by some big quantity in terms of n and d. So there'll be a polynomial n and d, um, or polynomial for fixed d, polynomial in n, that bounds this, but more importantly um, I can give a, a tighter bound by using the so-called H vector of the broken circuit complex of the corresponding matroid. So this linear space gives a matroid of uh, rank d plus 1 on an n element set and uh, I'm not going to define this, you know, you might have to take a class maybe a t on, on matroid theory, so there's a simplicial complex called the broken circuit complex and uh, this is a, an invariant called the H vector and then here I can bound this by 2 times I H I. Okay. Um, what's behind this? Yes, question? Uh, when you are saying the degree of the Gauss curve, do you mean the degree actually in the sense of uh, like algebraic geometry? In the sense of algebraic geometry. But it is depending on the embedding space and that's, uh, it doesn't seem to be actually having any M actually in the expression. Maybe I didn't understand. Okay, so I think uh, the degree normally depends on the dimension of the ambient space and how we embed this one. Yeah, so this curve, so this curve C is embedded. Yes. So that's the previous, I gave you the prime ideal on the previous slide. Gamma is the Gauss curve. So the Gauss curve is the curve in a hyperplane get traced out by the intersections of the tangent lines. So it's a it's a curve in the projectivization of a particular plane at infinity. Okay. So, so it's an algebraic curve. Actually, we are actually considering something extremely over here, actually. Which depends on the embedding. Um, well the curve C in some sense depends on the embedding. The gamma, the map gamma doesn't depend on the embedding. Right? So the map gamma is you know that's an intrinsic that's intrinsic to the curve. So I should maybe say this is a classical object, this has been studied. So the classical formulas and algebraic geometry that say you know if you have if you know if you have a smooth curve and you know the degree and the genus so we learned this from Ragri Pina so if you know the degree and the genus of the curve then there's an expression um, in terms of the Gauss for, for the degree of the Gauss curve but since I know by Proudfoot and Spire the degree and the genus of the the central curve I can just apply that and that's how this is proved this is not difficult but of course, the, uh, you're absolutely right, uh, here in the central curve, uh, this depends on the coordinate system, right? So if I have a linear space, then uh, the central sheet will depend. So I might have, it will depend on the matroid, right? So if I have a, a linear space that's general relative to the coordinate systems, this will have a high degree, n minus 1 choose d. If this blue thing is a very special plane, it's a very, very special plane coming from your, you know, traveling salesman matrix, you have some very special combinatorial matrix, then this will be a special matroid and then the degree will be much smaller, the degree will be the so-called Merbius invariant.
Right? So this is not invariant on the linear changes of course. That's the point. It's not invariant. It's a matroid invariant. Okay, uh, so let's go back. So, so the point in some sense of this theorem is that yes, there is a general bound um, and this is very similar and asymptotically that's not so different to what Didier and Schupp did. But if you have a special linear program with a special matrix, then by doing a matroid theoretic analysis, you get a, a tighter bound. The general bound, is that the bound for the hmm? general matrix? That's for, uh, for general yeah. matrix, that's, that's the answer. That's the answer. That's, that's, well, that's the answer to this number. Right. Of course, you know, this, there's a lot of slack in this inequality. So in this inequality, in some sense, this is the best you can do with, with algebraic methods. To get closer, you have to do analysis. So this is the best you can do with purely algebraic methods. Okay, well, you know, I was supposed to speak for 90 minutes and looks like I'm already done after 28. So uh, we'll have lots and lots of time to, uh, to talk some more. I have some more material. But, so the whole, I mean, the contribution is here is that you, if you have a special matrix, you can do better. Yes, the point is you can do better. You get this number expressed as a matroid theoretic formula. And I don't want to tell you exactly what this is. You know, it's Friday afternoon and you might have to talk to a combinatorialist. Okay, let's, uh, re let's do an example. You know? so, so here is a special matrix, just to kind of get the feeling for this. So let's say n is 5 and d is 2. And let's look at the primal linear programming with, with this special matrix. So the first row, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. And last row, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. Okay? So I pick a right-hand side, maybe 3, 2. Right? So I have two linear equations. I'm in five space. So I have a, a polytope in five-dimensional space given by non-negativity constraints and two linear equations. That's a three-dimensional polytope with six, sorry, five facets. And this polytope is this triangular prism. Okay, so in this case, AX equal B, X non-negative, is this triangular prism, also known as Toblerone in Swiss German. Well, let's pick C, some cost function, and here's the equations. So then, once we have the cost function, we have the central curve here in blue, right? So the central curve here in red is the analytic center of the triangular prism. In green are the six vertices. And here is the central curve for this particular cost vector, 1, 2, 0, 4, 0. And that's a, a space curve of degree 5. Okay? The degree, by the way, is always the sum of the, the entries in the h vector. Now here uh, we have the equations that cut out this curve. This is of course a curve that lives in 5 space. It lives inside the 3 space given by AX equal B. Right, so here are the equations AX equal B. And here we have the reciprocalized co-circuits. So there's one quadric and three cubics. And this is simply you know, reciprocalizing the co-circuits of the matrix A. So this is the universal Grobner basis for the central sheet and then I throw in my linear equations. Okay, so the curve is degree 5 and the formula on the previous slide, you know, if you run through the formula, gives an upper bound of 12. So if you apply this formula to uh, this situation here, you get the degree is 12. So this is a plane curve of degree 12. So the Gauss curve, so so there's a Macaulay 2 program, so I have a Macaulay 2 script that takes this input and makes a plane curve, irreducible plane curve, the Gauss curve, and in this example actually the curve is degree exactly 12. Okay, Okay. so that was the bayer question, this was the total curvature. Let's use the remaining time to think a little bit more geometrically about the primal and the dual. So the way people really solve this nowadays, uh, the modern interior point methods, they're so-called primal dual methods. They work both simultaneously on the primal and the dual. Let's try to see whether we can understand the primal dual geometry in an invariant way. Now when you look at the you know, linear program as it comes to you in the textbook, 
it looks, doesn't look like symmetric, right? The primal looks different from the dual. Right? And that's something that always bothered me. So let's take the next minute and derive a formulation of linear programming that has a symmetric formulation of the primal and dual. So let's reboot. Let's start afresh. Suppose I have a matrix A. Let L be the row space of this matrix. And let L perp be orthogonal complement. This is a real matrix, so we're in R to the n. So I have a linear space in R to the n. I have the orthogonal complement to the linear space. Now, to code the right-hand side B, I'm going to represent that by a pre-image number A. So I'm going to fix a vector G such that A, G equals B. Okay? So now, I can look at the following situation. I look at all points X in L perp plus G. I look at all perp points S in L plus C, and I require complementary slackness then that describes the primal dual central path. So the primal dual central path in the product of the x space, the primal space x, and the dual space s is the solution set to this equation as lambda varies. Right? Now, to make the problem easier, whenever we deal with applied algebraic geometry, we make the problem easier by disregarding inequalities, by replacing the real numbers by the complex numbers and by replacing affine space by projective space, we regard this as an irreducible curve in Pn times Pn. And we're interested in this curve. So is this clear? So suppose you just entered the room. Suppose you never heard about linear programming in your life. This is the definition of linear programming, right? Linear program is solving this equation. Linear program is the following problem. Take a linear space, take its orthogonal complement, shift the linear space to an affine space, shift the orthogonal complement, find a point that satisfies complementary slackness, non-negative coordinates. That is linear programming. Okay? So if you didn't know linear programming, I just told you 15 seconds ago, and that's a symmetric formulation, right? So this is exactly a reformulation of this, but now it looks symmetric. Okay, so this is kind of, this picture is a sneak preview. Now I have, you know, in Pn, in the x space, Pn, I have my primal curve, which is the projection of this curve into the x space. This is the s space. I have a projection into the dual space. So let's visualize this for the case n equals 4, where A is a 2 by 4 matrix. So here's going to be the picture in the X space. And in blue, I have the primal dual curve. Here's the projection into the S space. So here I have an arrangement of four hyperplanes. Over there, I have the dual arrangement of four hyperplanes. This is, Andreas, this is matroid duality, right? So this is the hyperplane arrangement, rank D, co-rank D. Okay? Now, what do, you, what do you observe? Well, first of all, the vertices of this hyperplane arrangement are in bijection with the vertices over there. So the bases of this matroid are in bijection with the co-bases over there, right? If you have a rectangular matrix, if you have a rectangular matrix and you make another matrix, such that the row space here is the orthogonal complement of the row space here, right? Well, the column bases here are the set complements of the column bases there. That's what I'm saying. Right? So the, the green vertices here are in bijection with the green vertices there. But notice that the analytic centers here of the bounded region correspond to the points at infinity over there. Well, that's also quite natural, right? Because if you look at this description at lambda equals zero, Right? You have equations like xi times si equals zero. Well, you have the additional equation x naught times s naught. So either s naught is zero, you have infinity here, or you're over there. So the analytic center here correspond to points of infinity there. Analytic centers here correspond to points of infinity there. Okay? Um, let's torture another graduate student. So maybe. Uh, do you know how many connected curves, how many connected components this curve has? So 
I've drawn a curve in P4 times P4 over the real numbers. How many connected components does this curve have? Two, right? Excellent. This has two connected components. So let's look at the projection, right? So here we go, it's one oval. We go A, D, A, we come back. Here's a second component. C, B, B, we come back, okay? Now over there I have exactly the same curve, right? So let's try this. So here I have D, here I start infinity. Then I go from D over here towards A, I'm over there. Now here my A, I'm at infinity, right? And so on. It's the same curve, right? It's exactly the same curve. That curve has two connected components. It lives inside P4 times P4. Let's summarize these observations in a general result. So, in general, we look at this dual pair, this oriented matroid, dual pair of hyperplane arrangements. So, we have the arrangement H given by the vanishing of the n coordinates xi in our shifted affine space Li plus L, L per plus g. And uh, this is Pn, this is the first Pn minus its hyperplane infinity. Likewise, we have the dual arrangement given by the vanishing of the ns coordinates in L plus c. Right? So I have an affine space, another affine space. In each of these affine spaces, I have a hyperplane arrangement of n hyperplanes. Then we have the following proposition that characterizes the analytic centers of the bounded regions. Let's take the first affine space and intersect it with the reciprocal of the orthogonal complement. That intersection is a zero-dimensional variety, reduced, if G is generic, a reduced zero-dimensional scheme, and every point is defined over R. Every complex point has, in fact, real components, and these are the analytic centers of the polytopes in the bounded regions, that are the bounded regions of the primal hyperplane arrangement H. Now if you didn't get 35 minutes ago the definition of analytic center, this is the definition, invariant definition of analytic center. Here's exactly the same thing, dual, so I take you know, the other affine space, L plus C, I intersect it with the reciprocal of the orthogonal complement, Again, a zero-dimensional scheme reduced. Every C-valued point is in fact defined over R, and these points are the analytic centers of the polytopes that form the bounded regions of the dual arrangement. So in the picture on the previous slide, these were the orange points, and these were the purple points. Now, then the global geometry that we saw in the example can be summarized as follows. So if we look at the primal central curve gotten by projecting into the X space, it passes through every green vertex of the primal hyperplane arrangement. In between these vertices, in between these green vertices, it passes through the purple analytic centers of the bounded regions. Likewise on the right side, the dual central curve in S space passes through all green vertices on the dual side and between them through the orange analytic centers. Along the vert curve, vertices on the left correspond to vertices on the right. Bases are in bijection with co-bases. And as I said, the analytic centers of the bounded regions on the left, the purple points on the left, correspond to the points at infinity on the dual curve on the right. And likewise, the other way around. Points at infinity here on the curve correspond to R the analytic centers on the right. Well, that's the global geometry. It's a symmetric formulation of linear programming of complementary slackness and of the primal dual approach. Me. Yes. Okay, then other <coughs> entry centers of polytopes you mentioned analytic centers. Yes. Yeah, I'm curious about the other uh, yeah, so they are, so these are the, so here the, the analytic centers are the purple points in the middle. Let me do the bigger picture. So, so here this is a bounded region. 
and this point is the analytic sample. Right, so, so I've given now two definitions of analytic sample. So one way to define this is if I make this the, the positive region, it's the unique point that maximizes the product of the coordinates. But maybe a better definition was the one I gave two minutes ago. It's you know the scheme theoretic intersection of the affine space and the reciprocal of the orthogonal complement. But these are the analytic centers of the bounded regions here. Maybe I didn't understand your question. I'm sorry. Yes. Can you then get, can you then get the analytic centers by averaging the coordinates? Uh, no. So these are not. Uh, this is not an additive average. It's kind of a kind of a multiplicative average in some sense. So really, to get the analytic center. Um, uh, in some sense, what I need to do is I need to solve the system of equations, right? So here I have uh, a system of d equations, here I have a system of n minus d equations, and I have to somehow find these points. Right? Uh, now, of course, in, in the actual solution, you know, there's a numerical method that gets me on the path. This is just a theory. Okay, so here's the global geometry. So let me wind down, uh, end the talk. So uh, the picture to remember maybe from this talk is this picture in the plane. So we have a, a central curve of degree six coming from an arrangement of seven lines in the plane. It has uh, this very nice property that it's fully real, right? So every intersection with a vertical red line creates six complex points, all of which are real. And as we travel along, we move, you know, numerically along these intersection points. So this is the picture to remember. And here is the same picture, you know, uh, sometimes nice to, uh, to do a little projective transformation. And this picture, you know, shows for experts in, in optimization that even in this linear programming situation, Inherently, we already have semi-definite programming. This is a spectrohedron, a so-called feasible region of a, a semi-definite programming problem. Excuse me. But yes. In this picture, you can you call the blue curve the polar curve. Uh huh. Right. How do you get the polar curve from the lines? Um, the lines are the gray ones, right? You don't have to push anything around. Yeah. So the lines are the the gray ones. Yes. So it's just I take the derivative, right? Exactly. So I take I the saying. yeah, and exactly. The equation of the lines. That's correct. That's a nice equation. Mm -hmm. And you here you have v two and v one. That's correct. Determine which partial you take. So in in these coordinates, so let me let me write down what uh, Christian said. So in this coordinate system, <coughs> you're absolutely right. So in this choice of coordinates, so I start, you know, f of x, y, z is the product of the seven lines of the linear forms. And then by polar, I simply mean the curve i from, or, uh, no, let's say, b0, df, dx plus b1 df dy, b2 df dz. Okay. So this one is degree 6. Except that you chose other coordinates. Oh yes, sorry, okay, b tilde. Yeah, this is the b, exactly, that's the curve. Now maybe as a side remark, it's very difficult to characterize which curves in the plane are polars of a given curve, and likewise, you know, sublocus of polars of line arrangements. So that's a very interesting question. You know, if I give you a blue curve, so a necessary condition is you have to be a maximally nested curve in the real sense. Um, but reconstructing the line arrangement, you know, from the curve is not so easy in, in general. Okay, so this is the end of the lecture. Um, so here's my conclusion slide. So first of all, one conclusion is the picture. So here's the, uh, the primal curve and the dual curve. So it's fun, you know, you can 
travel along. So we explored this geometry. So there's a conclusion, I think, uh, in this talk. So the conclusion for pure mathematicians is that optimization is actually a very beautiful subject. So often when you take your first undergraduate class in optimization, it's sometimes not presented so well. Right? Linear programming is presented by bumping Tableau around and you know, doing something strange with basic Tableau and so on. But the, the geometry of linear, and in fact nonlinear programming, is very, very beautiful. So the message for the pure, pure mathematicians in the audience is that optimization is a beautiful, certainly beautiful, and occasionally potentially deep subject for the applied mathematicians is algebraic geometry is very useful. So the use of nonlinear methods of nonlinear algebra can give some insight, answer questions that maybe have asked, people have asked, and uh, perhaps for the dinner discussion at the Chinese restaurant, I'll leave you with this question. <laughs> Thanks for your attention.